Good evening, dear participants. We are coming to the close of the NHRD and Mind Matters Week. The, this, is, this is one of the last uh, sessions as part of this entire initiative, which is aimed at promoting mental health and awareness uh, at the workplace in particular, and of course, in the society at large. We are happy to uh, share with you this list of organizations who have very enthusiastically come on board for this initiative, where um, we had made available to them a variety of offerings. A total of 111 organizations have partnered with us. And all this week, what you see on the screen are a variety of sessions that we had organized for anyone who was keen to attend. The entire offering was entirely free of cost. And um, as you see, there were uh, sessions on basic mental health awareness, as well as little practice uh, sessions and tips for you to improve your mental health. What you are attending now is part of a series of deep dive sessions. As you would see, there are a variety of topics that we dealt with, and uh, there were those including suicide and self-harm at the workplace, gender and sexuality in the workplace, substance use, uh, depression and anxiety, and today, eating disorders and body image issues at the workplace. There were also a lot of story sharing sessions where um, very inspirational personalities uh, some of them, uh, as you see on the screen, there's Parimal Gandhi, there's Rashi Thakran, there's Melna, who we heard yesterday. Uh, they're, uh, you know, amazing stories of how they've actually overcome uh, various uh, issues around mental health and uh, stand out as shining examples of how it's entirely manageable and can be taken care of. Here is uh, a glimpse of the toolkit that um, we had made available to all participating organizations, right from the kind of messaging that needs to go to employees to help if they require on drafting the mental health policy, as well as a uh, resource person list for employee assistance programs. And we also conducted a Mind Matters ambassador certification uh, to try and upskill representatives, very chosen few from participating organizations, to uh, be champions of mental health awareness at the workplace. There also are free LinkedIn courses that uh, we have included as part of our set of offerings. Uh, LinkedIn has been uh, kind enough to come on board as a learning partner. And what you see listed here are some of the courses we have added a few more to this list um, you will be able to access information pertaining to this on the nationalhrd.org website on the mind matters page so we urge you to um, visit this uh, page to leverage these unique very useful courses available on linkedin a few ground rules before we quickly uh, you know ensure that we don't delay the session and all the interesting discussions that are to follow uh, we've kept your lines on mute uh, do let us know if you would like to ask a question we'll be happy to unmute your line or do use the questions window to type in questions and we will uh, address them in course of the uh, session there will be a feedback form that we will share with you please ensure that you fill this up it's very important that we know exactly what you think of uh, the entire set of offerings and uh, most importantly do help us spread the word we need you to uh, use our handle and hashtag that you see on the screen to uh, talk about what you think in terms of the entire nhrd and mind matters initiative that's the only way to spread the word so we urge you to do that our speakers for the day are a uh, uh, a delightful set whom you will get introduced to very soon and uh, even more delightful if i may say is the moderator for the session uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you dr sujata sriram she is a professor at the school of human ecology at 
Tata Institute of Social Sciences, also known as TIS. Um, she enjoys teaching and research. Uh, she uh, describes herself as someone who's eternally curious and uh, enjoys finding out what makes people tick. Uh, she likes to uh, conduct research in topics, areas such as families, childcare and parenting, marriage and divorce, mental health and well being, uh, meaning making of identity, religion, and spirituality, and so on. Uh, she, of course, teaches courses on psychology, research methods, uh, and human development for students at TIS. Uh, she is on the national executive of the Association for Early Childhood Education and Development, also known as AECED, which is an advocacy network for children below the age of eight years. And she is also a member of the International Stress Management Association. It's been a delight to have uh, Dr. Shiram as part of the core team who actually uh, brought the entire set of offerings from the drawing board to uh, the state that it is in today. So a warm welcome to you, Dr. Shiram and Dr. Bagadia, uh, Rohini, uh, Jyotsna, all of you. Uh, over to you, Dr. Shiram. Thank you, Nisha. I know it's been a long week. And I think uh, last week this time, we didn't believe that we would be here in this week. So it's been, I think, quite a journey for us. And uh, in terms of, you know, the kind of things that we've been able to, you know, bring through, I think uh, it's been a journey for all of us. Uh, for me, it's been an experience working with uh, people who don't belong to academia. So in terms of working with HR types, that's again been my learning. Uh, and uh, I struggled a bit, but uh, that said, let's start with the session today. And I think, uh, you know, I believe there are some 300 odd people who are here for the session. Uh, I know that Ashlesha, Rohini, Jyotsna, and I've had a lot of fun while talking about what needs to go into this session. And I hope you have as much of fun listening to what we have to say. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, the kind of issues that we're going to talk about are things that a lot of us deal with in our everyday lives because the way i see it there's a lot that you know we have in terms of our relationships with food and with our bodies now if you think back to childhood i'm sure all of us remember you know the kind of foods that uh, your mom or your grandmom used to make for you and these are comfort foods very often and these are things foods that we still like to eat today especially when you're in distress and the way I see it, somewhere I think along the way, our relationship with food has begun to change. And again, you know, it, in India, we have this strange notion that eating disorders is something that doesn't happen in India, but happens only in the West. But actually, that's not really true, because there was a 2018 study that said that about, you know, between 25 and 40 percent of adolescent girls in, uh, uh, in India suffered from eating disorders, and about 20% of boys did. These are adolescents. And we need to recognize that the incidence of eating disorders and disordered eating are on the rise in India. And there are several things that we know today are associated with disordered eating. These relate with you know, emotional state. You know, there are times when you, uh, you, know, you crave food or certain types of food. Sure, many of us have gone through the state when we want to eat something sweet, you know, kuch meetha khane ka man kar raha hai. Want to eat chocolate and you go on, you know, you feel that, you know, you desperately crave chocolate. Uh, there are also the sociocultural factors that are there which related with which are related with food. And also with the perception of the body. Uh, if we think about it, you know, there are a number of these weight-related observations which are made very casually and also very cruelly by people. And these could be multiple people, you know, family, peers, colleagues. And we very rarely see how these comments are received or how they affect the psyche of the individuals at the receiving end. Again, when we think of, you know, how the thin ideal has been publicized, both for girls, especially for girls, for boys, it's much more the thing about, you know, the uh, way bodybuilding kind of a thing. And uh, the media has, of course, been responsible for a lot of this. For example, you know, the uh, the space between the thighs, I think it's called thigh gap. 
I'm a little beyond that stage, but then I think a lot of younger people would be knowing more about it. Things like, you know, there's something also equally cruel that was there called the pencil test. And a lot of these are related with issues of body image. So today's conversation is essentially on body image and problems related with eating and food. And over the course of the hour and a half that we have, We'll try and understand from the standpoint of mental health practitioners about how they see body image and disorder eating. Again, how to identify when there is a problem and more importantly, what can we do in terms of prevention? So our panelists for today, we have Dr. Ashleshna Bagadia, who's a psychiatrist and a therapist with 20 years of clinical experience. Her areas of specialization are mental health during pregnancy and the, uh, the postnatal period personality disorders, and family therapy. It's interesting, all three panelists today are from Bangalore. That happened accidentally, it didn't happen deliberately. Uh, Ashlesha is the head of psychotherapy at the Green Oak Initiative, which is a community mental health center in Fraser Bangalore. Uh, in her own words, she's passionate about mental health of clinicians, including physicians and therapists. And following the COVID crisis, the Green Oak team started a helpline, the first helpline in India, exclusively for healthcare workers, offering free and confidential psychosocial and psychological support. Then we have Dr. Jobs now, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and psychotherapist with 15 years of experience in the field of mental health. Uh, Dr. Jotsna is uh, has a private practice in Bangalore where she works with adolescents and adults with a wide range of mental health concerns, which include anxiety, mood disorders, personality disorders. She's also involved in supervision and training of therapists. In her clinical practice and clinical supervision and training, she generally tends to use the attachment framework. And our last speaker, last but not the least, Rohini, is uh, Rohini Rajiv is a psychotherapist with more than 18 years of clinical and corporate counseling experience. She's the founder director of De-Stress Holistic Health, and a senior consultant in marital and family therapy at RxDx multi-speciality multi clinic, Bengaluru. I hope I've said that right, uh, Rohini, RxDx. Yes. Uh, she's a relationship counseling expert who specializes in couple therapy, women's mental health, resilience building, all of the things that we're going to be talking about during the course that we've been talking about actually for during the course of uh, this week. Uh, her areas of expertise include psychotherapy for different levels of distress across age group. Now, I think without much ado, I think we should start with our questions. Now, the way we've uh, thought about it is we have a pool of questions which I will be uh, you know, asking maybe one, two, or all three of you. And also, along the way, we will be looking at questions that come from the audience. So I think uh, let's start with that. So. Maybe Ashlesha, maybe you could start. Uh, let's try and deconstruct this thing of eating disorders and disordered eating. How would we break this down for our audience? Thank you. Um, I'm actually very excited to be part of this week-long uh, uh, you know, series that has been introduced by uh, NHRDM. And I'm glad that we're actually talking about eating disorders and disordered eating, because I think when we think of eating disorders, it's usually thought of as someone with anorexia, someone with you know bulimia. These are the words that are traditionally known, and uh, so of course they do exist in the diagnostic framework. And something like anorexia is a is a condition where someone uses uh, food as a way of restricting, you know, so not wanting to eat to try and reach a desired body weight. Okay, so. That is anorexia nervosa, where there is a lot of uh, belief that they need to be thinner than they are. The person believes that they need to be thinner than they actually are, and there is a lot of uh, behaviors around controlling the amount of food they intake, along with other behaviors that uh, can contribute to losing weight, like exercising excessively and um, you know, using certain uh, uh, medications that can help you reduce weight. Now, that you know, classic kind of anorexia nervosa, which people might have seen depicted in movies and serials and, you know, have heard or read about, is something that we don't see that often in general clinical practice everywhere. 
you know so uh, all all three of us are uh, clinicians were not based in institutions so in the community practice you don't you would not see anorexia nervosa like that in its classic form that commonly uh, having said that the other form of eating disorder which is you know bulimia nervosa for example uh, is where there is this focus on weight but there is also what is called a binge eating you know eating to for gratification now the variations of bulimia are seen uh, across the community uh, you know and i think what you were mentioning to in your study the eating disorders are the rise are when we see the variations of binge eating you know uh, binging to gratify binging for uh, reducing stress you know using food so as a way of reducing what do you mean when you say binging what is, what would binging be what how would you understand binging so you know when i crave chocolate is that binging now if you crave chocolate that's actually probably all of us do but when you when you keep eating even beyond your uh, you know uh, satisfaction for example so the binging is where it's gone out of control and it's continuous it's rapid it's almost like you're just doing it mindlessly so that binging part is mindless it's impulsive and it is uh, excessive so even the people who describe it would talk about that excessive eating in a short frame of time you know it's a in a short span of time so i'm eating i'm craving a chocolate i go and i sort of take a couple of blocks maybe i take two more so that's not binging even if i eat a whole bar of chocolate in one sitting that may not be binging if i'm just eating it to enjoy it and say i'm going to eat this chocolate but if i'm eating it quickly because i want to just feel better or if i am doing it impulsively because i am trying to gratify something or reduce stress now that would be binging and it could be chocolate it could be chips it could be anything that is done in that kind of behavior uh so that is binging now there is a, if you come to the disordered eating that you were talking about there is certain element of binging in disordered eating also but it's not done with that intention of binging so disordered eating is probably something that comes a lot with a lifestyle uh comes a lot with what's going on around us now where when we are stressed we seek food for comfort or we restrict ourselves from eating because uh, for emotional reason so disordered eating is sorry yes what so no, sorry so you are saying me. that both uh, there is this tendency both to eat and to also not eat yes so can we try and understand that a little bit more so maybe can i hand the mic over to jyots now Yotsna, can you uh, say a little bit more about this? Can't hear you. Yotsna, we can't hear you. So maybe while Yotsna is fixing her uh, sound, uh, Rohini, would you like to talk about it in terms of you know issues of uh, you know this disordered eating, this wanting to eat versus not wanting to eat? Yes, I think especially with uh, what uh, Dr. Shmeesha just mentioned, the disordered eating and especially binge eating is what we deal with more commonly in our day-to-day -day practice, um, irrespective of it coming as a disorder. So what happens is they eat compulsively fast uh, till they bloat, and then it, the whole process disgusts them. So then they try to throw up and get rid of those things, and it it is a way in which they try to judge themselves and you know end up feeling quite miserable about who they are and the whole dysfunction relationship that they have with food and how they take out their emotions and uh, you know in, in a completely unhealthy uh, pattern so food not for, for health reasons food not because it helps you know you grow or you know build your strength but food as a way of taking out your feelings dealing with your problems and coping with it in you know your own unhealthy way and the problem with this also is that um, binge eating or bulimia is difficult to identify it's, you know if someone is anorexic for example you can identify them easily because they lose weight drastically and, um you know a family or a friend can make out oh my god you're so thin and you know what is going on with you whereas if you have binge eating the chances of this is becoming oh she's putting on weight or he's putting on weight um and not considering it as a problem tends to be an issue that we deal with more often so understanding it recognizing that symptom family friends colleagues co-workers 
uh, that is really important, uh, Dr. Shriya. So, you know, Jotsna, the whole associated something? relationship. Sorry? Jyotsna, you want to add something to this? Thanks, Rohini. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, unfortunately, we still can't hear you, Jyotsna. Uh, take my head. Is yeah, this better? Uh, yes, much better. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> So I think uh, both the speakers, what they were talking about is somehow food is not about satisfying hunger anymore. Food begins to uh, play a different role in people who have difficulty with uh, eating. So uh, the hunger and satiety, that is completely, that relationship is completely gone when um, you have a difficulty with uh, disordered eating. So uh, food becomes a way of, um, um, expressing and uh, taking and nurturing. Food becomes a way of controlling uh, emotions. Food becomes a way of handling stress. Food becomes a way of expressing um, some sort of a disgust or shame about one's body itself. So food plays a lot of other roles apart from just about satisfying one's hunger. And that's when it begins to become a problem. So it's, it's no longer about I feel like eating and I enjoy eating and I eat. I eat until I actually have to throw up. I eat until I can't bear to eat anymore. Or I eat, but I don't want um, to be um, satisfied by that eating. So I end up throwing up the food that I have eaten. So it, it becomes very distorted. And that relationship continues to get very perverse. And that's when you would call it uh, disordered eating. So, you know, from what I'm hearing, there's a lot of the emotional state of the individual that's coming into play. And uh, alongside, there's also the thing that's coming from the outside, you know, in terms of how others see you. Because in terms of, you know, what should you be looking like? So, you know, and how you should be appearing for others, that also seems to be coming up as a factor here. You know, how, what would you like to say to that? Who are you? Anybody. <laughs> I'm throwing it open to anybody there. <laughs> so I'll go. Um, I, I think, I mean, that is definitely a big factor. Like Josna was saying, it's no longer about hunger. So I, I'm stressed and so I'm eating, but also I'm very aware of what, what's going to happen to me and my body when I'm eating like this. So there is a huge kind of, it's not even like you're enjoying that binging. You know, there is a constant, I shouldn't be eating this. I shouldn't be eating this. I'm going to put on weight. What's going to happen? What will I look like? You know, so uh, definitely now uh, in the society, in, like you uh, said in the introduction, in subtle ways, in not so subtle ways, in very overt, uh, you know, blatant ways, we are, there is body shaming, there is an expectation to look a certain way. Um, and so it's constantly there on the, in the mind of people who are, I mean, I think all of us, not even when you're binging, I think when we are around food, there is a certain kind of like a voice in the back that, that is there. That, you know we have to be careful around food it's no longer about this is this is something i'm going to enjoy and relax around food it's all about how how careful i have to be around food and that seems to be there as an undertone so you shouldn't be seen to avoid eat or enjoy food in public you can eat at home or on in your on your own in your room but others shouldn't see you enjoying especially food that is seen as being unhealthy is that the way it works I, I'm not so sure actually. I feel like maybe I will let others uh, address that and I'll, I, want, I want to come back after others have addressed it. So, uh, sure. Sure. Uh, I think what we are talking about is uh, what starts off in our life where food, you, you feel like eating something and you just go eat. There is no thought about whether this is good food or bad food or is this healthy food or junk food or how much should I be eating this. You feel like having it and you have it. But as you grow older, I think there are these images that the society also has and we also kind of learn uh, through our own interactions with other people that there are certain things which are expected. Um, so healthy food is supposed to be had and unhealthy food is supposed to be something of, a, a, you know, it, it a signifies lack of control of oneself. Uh, it, it begins to take on uh, a judgment, uh, a label that one begins to feel very heavy about. So um, a, a certain body weight, a certain body shape, 
uh, certain kinds of food to be eaten, uh, certain kinds of food to be avoided. So all of these become very laden with judgment. That it, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish between I feel like having it. So the words that we use around it is, uh, it's not that I felt like having it. it. It is called an indulgence. It is called decadence. It is called uh, loss of control. It is called, um, you know, um, it is called a cheating day. So it, it comes with such heavy labels. Negative it's very associates. difficult to really enjoy a bar of chocolate without actually, uh, you know, going through a series of things to say, okay, I hope this is not uh, impulse control. I hope this is not eating disorder. So you, there is no joy in having that anymore. How did we get this uh, way? <laughs> the voice that Ashlesha was talking about is not just your voice, the voice of your family members or someone who tells you when you're eating, suppose you're 14, 15 years old, which is the time when eating disorders technically begin to show, is that how many of Rasagula will you have or how many Mysore packs are you going to have, you know? What's wrong with you? Stop eating. You're going to bloat up or you're going to look like an elephant or, you know, or they associate thin children uh, to be twigs, skeletons, you know, we have, uh, so many negative associations with body imaging, it starts at home. Not both the parents. too thin, both the too thin as well as the too heavy. Yes. So again, how do we judge that in between? People are never happy. There's always someone who's judging you. So young children, including boys, not just girls, you know. Ah, thanks. I think uh, that is a very important point that you made, not just <laughs> girls, but boys as well. Yeah. Because I think yeah. there's this a uh, cute notion that you know problems with food are much more for girls and much girls are much more unhappy with the way they look yeah. and so you know there's a lot more pressure on girls to you know approximate uh, approximate body weight so uh, can we talk a little bit about this gender dimension you know about you know is it different for boys and girls is it seen the same way what happens differently yeah Jyotsna, over to you. Um, in my practice, I think the others can also uh, pitch in with what they have observed. I feel that the, the stereotypes still exist. It does not mean that uh, it is equal for both genders. When we look at diagnosing, I think most often we uh, women are uh, diagnosed more with uh, both body image issues as well as um, uh, eating disorders. I think uh, but I think it, it presents perhaps in a slightly different way with, um, uh, with the other gender. I think the expected body shape is different. Uh, it's not just thin anymore. It is more about being toned, um, the six pack or the eight pack abs. So uh, uh, the images that we are exposed to on social media and the Instagram and um, the filtered images that we get to see and the unrealistic comparison that we tend to have about how we expect ourselves to be seen that way uh, is twofold because um, when we compare our bodies like that, it's not just about the people who have not attained that uh, ideal shape. It is also about people who have perhaps attained that who are now worried about losing it. So it's mm -hmm. constantly about uh, either worried that I'm not there or once I'm there, when will I actually get off it? So I think the stereotypes do exist, but um, I think it presents itself slightly differently between uh, different genders. Um, okay. I don't know what Ashley, the other, you want to pick up uh, on that. Others feel about it. Yeah, I kind of uh, agree with it to some extent. I think there is definitely a difference in how it uh, presents. Uh, I, I suspect fit for women, and maybe it's changing now. You know, I think the whole gender uh, paradigm is also changing, yes. but it's still a long way to go. I think there is. Um, uh, certain expectation for women to look a certain way and there is it's a lot more ingrained about how you know the, uh, the body image but what I'm also noticing in in say uh, men who at some point are becoming a lot more health conscious you know and maybe have the time and the luxury or are now starting to think for themselves and not being fed by you know their mother or their wife or now are thinking okay what do I want to eat and it, it seems to be around the 30s 40s that they're starting to say, I'm going to, you know, start running, I'm going to start doing this, I'm going to look after my uh, weight myself. But there, what we see as a disorder becomes almost like uh, now with a zeal, I have to undo all these things that I've kind of endure, you know, managed to put on weight till now. So I have to undo everything. 
So there you see this disordered, perhaps uh, disordered uh, eating or even disordered uh, obsessionality around how they have to reach a certain weight, how they have to maintain. I think maintaining is a big stress, like uh, Jyotsna was saying, you know, and almost to the exclusion of other activities that I have to now do this to the exclusion of everything else. And that just seems to be there in men and it's emerging more in men. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rohini, you want to add on to that? Given yes, the fact that you started um, with the issue of talking about boys and girls. Yes. Uh, if I was mentioning it to you earlier during our conversation today about if you Google body imaging, you know, the first or the third screen that comes up is how do men like women? Okay. And there's like a, thousands of hits for it and videos, uh, messages, you know, answers about men like women in a certain shape and men like women in a certain body weight and so if this is the kind of uh, message we are sending across to younger generations to the to the you know the tech savvy generation of today that okay there is a certain ideal body image there's a body weight even for boys you know it has to be v-shaped there's to be a chiseled chest and a small waistline and things like that um everything's about idealism everything is about you know um, there is no uh, imperfectionism is almost like unacceptable. You can't be uh, what is not accepted by probably social media. You know, everything is about Instagram and being conscious about who you are. So it is becoming gender neutral. Before it used to be body image used to be about receding hairlines or you know crooked nose or fixing your teeth. Now it's become about your waistline and about your bust, your chest, your hair, your nose, and you know your cheeks and your jaw and you know, everything. So we're becoming an obsessed culture. I'm going and to pick up some questions that have come from the audience. There's one that mm -hmm. asks uh, whether there's any correlation between eating disorders and depression. Yeah. So Ashleisha, would you want to pick that up first? Yeah, sure. So. Um... Eating disorders or disordered eating, I both of them. Eating when disorders, when food is the is question. Eating, yes, so eating disorders definitely th there is a strong correlation with uh, depression. People with eating disorders are at higher risk of uh, getting depressed, and uh, also they go through periods of depression. Uh, sometimes they even only come to the attention of mental health professionals only when they have been severely depressed. So that that almost becomes the only time when they come to the attention of mental health professionals. Um, so there is definitely a strong correlation and uh, yeah, they're at higher risk of uh, becoming depressed. So it's the depression that gets uh, noticed first and then the uh, problem with food. And it's possible also Often. that uh, one of the ways of food settling food. the depression was the problem, with, was the food. Yeah. Also, I feel now as, as the stigma around depression is reducing, that seems to be a little bit more easier way of approaching also that I'm depressed. It seems to be easier for people to come to for help rather than, you know, I have an eating disorder or a difficulty with eating. So definitely that seems to be a way of accessing. I think Jyotsna wants. Yeah, Jyotsna. Um, so what I also feel is because all of these are on a continuum, it's very difficult to uh, actually pinpoint this is more or that is more. What really happens with, with both depression and uh, disordered eating is it's it really uh, varies from um, I don't feel like having certain kinds of food or mm -hmm. I'm uncomfortable about, uh, you know, no, um, not following diets on certain days to uh, I will uh, I will really throw up everything that I eat or I will completely skip meals. So because of that kind of a range, um, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to see which one is more or less. The other major thing is both eating disorders um, as well as uh, uh, mood disorders have an underlying emotional component to it so mm -hmm. anxiety and mood and what really uh, is, uh, is is the foundation for both these difficulties so eating disorder is not just about uh, difficulty with eating it is about managing an emotional distress through eating or that ex yeah. uh, that manifests itself through eating so, yeah, uh, um, I have seen a lot of clients where it's the other aspect, no? I mean, whether you, when they're depressed, their way of coping 
with that grief or their sadness or their extreme distress is by binge eating. You know, so I'm so sad today, so I'm going to order pizza and I'm going to have a tub of ice cream, which is also shown in movies, which is also shown in sitcoms that, you know, oh, you have you've gone through a breakup. How, how do they depict the person? She's, she is sitting at home with pajama. It's usually a she. Uh, you know, and badly dressed, mm-hmm. hair is unkempt, and then she's sitting with a tub of ice cream. Yeah, so she's that's binge eating, and that is shown as an appropriate way of coping, which is the most unhealthy way that you can teach them. So, uh, which is again, you know, you dep- you're depressed, you eat, and you eat obsessively. That that is seen quite commonly here. In fact, I have a lot of clients who struggle with that, and then they gain weight. And then they get more depressed because now they have to deal with the other aspect of, uh, you know, body shaming. Oh, you become so bad. Who's going to marry you? And uh, so they don't know what is their real problem. You know, so they do not deal with what's bothering them and focus on issues that come as a result of the actual issue and not the real issue, so, which I think is seen a lot in practice. In fact, youngsters. So, so actually what you're bringing up uh, especially you, Rohini, uh, you know, a lot related with the sociocultural factors that seem to be contributing to problems with both uh, food as well as with the body. You know, I'm not looking at which came first. I would say that, you know, they seem to be almost, you know, it's uh, difficult to say which came first. Yeah, it's one of those chicken and egg kind of things. Uh, and again, there seems to be lots of things within the cultural factors, you know, that uh, especially, I mean, what is it if you look at India that makes this kind of problems with eating disorders so much more, uh, especially, I think, over the last few years, maybe the last couple of decades? Uh, Jyotra, can I address that question to you? Sure. Um, I think... One is the relationship that we have um, about with food itself. I think food is a way of expression of love. Food is a way that um, that our grandmothers and mothers would kind of, you know, demonstrate their love to us. So if you really love me, you will have this. Or you did not take a second helping. You don't really love me. Or you know, I see you once in a while only. So why don't you finish this food? Or uh, you know, uh, finishing the plate entirely. Or not saying no to food. Or they deciding when we are full or when we are not full. So all of these are some, in some way does not uh, help the individual take on responsibility for one's own hunger and uh, satiety. So it becomes very difficult to separate emotion and love from food. Um, so that is one thing that I feel in our culture makes a lot of difference about how we look at different foods. And um, of course, the uh, the media influence and uh, the film industry, uh, the filters um, in the uh, social media, all of these, uh, it makes it a very difficult uh, bridge, uh, difficult thing to uh, bridge what we see in reality to what we see on the screen, what we see in reality to what we um, what we hear other people talk about on the media. It's very difficult to actually. Uh, bridge that gap and I think that also creates a lot of confusion uh, in our minds so I think both those probably make it um, a very very significant uh, factor in uh, eating disorders and disorder eating in our culture. So, uh, Because when you're looking at satiety that kind of issue actually starts up in childhood so so during childhood, when you can't say when you've eaten enough, because your mother is trying to tell you that nay, nay, do roti khana I mean, without eating two rotis, you can't be full. Yeah. Is that the kind of uh, message that ultimately, you know, leads us to not feel sure about, you know, how much to eat? I don't think yeah, so. Klesha or Rohini or Jyotsna. I don't think we encourage right, autonomy I, uh, in our culture. We don't encourage autonomy. Yeah, that's a nice single uh, statement. It's <laughs> very useful to look at, I think. So and we deep. start with food. Especially around this is what we do, right? We fill it up. And the move, uh, a child who eats well, and she brought up the grandma point, which is very important. The child who eats well is the good child. 
the child who doesn't eat well is the unhealthy child and uh, the child who the mother is not taking care of i mean that's the first question people ask right do you not feed your child i mean like you get out in your child is or mm. why are you feeding your child so much there's so much pressure on the parents especially the mother nobody asks the father why do you not feed the child so you know again the parents are quite uh, they don't know we don't know where to draw a line here huh. as a therapist and as a mother <laughs> i think that's where it goes in um, i don't think grandmothers appreciate it if mothers get involved they'll please stop feeding you know the child with these things or children associating special unhealthy food with their grandparents you know yeah. what what have you made for me i mean it, it is food we are a very food obsessed uh, culture yeah. but there's nothing wrong in it as long as we are able to draw a line ashlesha yeah i i completely agree with uh, what's been said i also think that uh, you know what is probably what you're seeing in the last uh, decade that you were asking us to look at is that there is a lot of uh, uh, pressure on parents to get everything right you have to feed the child yeah. make sure they're fed properly they have to also get all the nutrition they have also to get the right amount of uh, you know uh, outdoor activity and uh, uh, stimulation cultural stimulation so there's so much to get right that sometimes food becomes another box to tick and so it's like i have to make sure that they finish eating you know and and now often in front of a device so the child doesn't know when the child is hungry mm -hmm. 12 o'clock time to finish eating you ate this much ho gaya my work is done you know so that also contributes a lot to um to to this the food being not you know uh, like a the relationship food with the food starts there getting getting uh, difficult starts there also i think what we are doing we end up getting contradictory messages like if you look at you know the most common place where we go to for a function or a wedding or for example where everyone and this is something that my daughter observed you know the first thing that people sort of say is how nice you look oh you lost weight since i saw you you know what have you been doing so on the one hand we are commenting on everyone's look and on the other hand we are force feeding each other or thoda le lo you one more laddu and eat some more and so it's 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 really contradictory messages when we when we are out they were assaulted with how we are looking and how, what we are eating and what we are not eating so definitely the culture plays a huge role uh, in and i feel like when the disordered eating starts often it seems like that's the only place where someone can control something mm -hmm. you know so one of the things that i think josa mentioned that uh, when there is stress uh, what i can't control this i can't control that but maybe i can control my food and that and you know the the pattern of trying to control the weight and the body image and my stress through food is not working and then it kind of slips into depression right so i think the the it, it's it's such a uh, web of these interpersonal relations between culture and society and our own internal anxiety i'm going to add another thing there you know it's also a way of punishing somebody your parent or your spouse spouse, spouse. <laughs> Yeah. There are lots of games being played, and uh, a real tangle in that sense. Yeah. So uh, let me take a one yeah, other Rosa, thing. Uh, one, sorry, uh, sure. please, Josh now first, and then Rohini. <laughs> I think uh, we spoke about Rohini. Yeah. So we spoke about depression and uh, disordered eating. The other really really important uh, aspect here is anxiety disorders and disordered eating, especially perfectionism. uh when ashlesha was talking about control uh those are some of the things that show up uh in people who uh, who are extremely anxious since there is no control over the future there is a deadline that's coming up i need to submit my assignment i don't really control how my professor will behave or how my boss will behave so the only thing that i can control is how much food goes into me and what kind of food goes into me and me throwing up as well mm. so it becomes a very very a uh, difficult cycle there that since i don't have any control over any other aspect of my life including my own mood then this becomes pr pretty much the only way that i can express some sort of a control somewhere so uh so depression and anxiety uh obsessive compulsive uh, thoughts as well as eating disorders are all part of the same kind of uh, food i think sorry when you go uh uh what i want to say is not connected to that what i wanted to mention here was food is also used as a motivating factor in companies you know companies that provide food 
provide catering services for their employees. Uh, I've noticed um, across the last probably a decade or so where the company changes the menu. Before there used to be like a whole bunch of, you know, there has to be sweets and there's a soup, there's a starter, there's this food. People look forward to that. And then suddenly there was this health wave that struck the Indian, uh, you know, corporate. And most companies started looking at providing healthy food for their employees. So the soup got changed to, you know, salad. The sweet got cut to buttermilk. And uh, <laughs> I don't think that had a great impact on the employees because one fine day you come for lunch with your friends and suddenly you find chas instead of, uh, you know, an ice cream. And who asked you? Mm -hmm. right? I mean, because the company is force feeding you to become healthy. Because again, we look at we don't want to leave the choice to the that was, uh, uh, Rohini, that was my next question in the sense that how do we advocate healthy eating? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, this kind of a strategy These that you're talking about. Telling people to eat healthy. Okay, so it doesn't help if you tell people to eat healthy. It needs to come from inside you. Uh, I think so. Yeah, Ashley, yeah, I, I think, so. I, I think I, no, I, 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 take, I think actually it's really interesting what Rohini is saying. I think it's important that we talk about being healthy. I think it's really important that it starts early. But I do think that the decision-making capacity should be left to the individual. You know, you, like nice. I think what Rohini is saying, if, if we, uh, what's happening perhaps is the companies are saying, this is what we're going to, uh, everyone should be eating. So it becomes like a fad and let's mm -hmm. all eat this healthy food like a fad. You know, so internally, because my company is giving this to me, I'm going to eat it. It's not like I feel like, what is my body type? What, what do I need? Do I need more protein? Do I need more carbs? When do I need what? You know, that individual developing that, how much do I need to eat to satisfy myself? That is what is lacking. And we are all, I think I'm, I'm taking time to figure it out for myself. We are all really trying to figure it out because it's not something that's there in our, you know, upbringing or in our culture. And Again, in, even in the work environment or any other, I mean, we're getting mixed messages, right? On the one hand, uh, companies are providing food or deciding what we're going to eat. On the other hand, Swiggy and, you know, everything else, that easy delivery. Food is easily available. Whatever we want is easily available at the tip of our fingers now. And I've had, you know, clients where parents are trying to uh, uh, put in some healthy uh, eating and the adolescent says, no, I'm just going to order something. So this, again, it's, it's so difficult to try and this, doing this as a rebel rather than this is what I really want. You know, they're not giving me good food, so I'm just going to go and cheat and treat myself as a rebel, rebelling act rather than I feel like doing this today. Is this good for me or not? You know, what's good for me or not? That, I think, is much harder to cultivate, and that's what we're struggling with right now. Mm -hmm. Jyotsna, you want to answer that? I think what we are talking about is really it's not so much about whether we do uh, eat an, an occasional dessert or not. I think we are talking about uh, what food means to us and uh, why are we eating what we are eating and what choices are we really making? Because I think the underlying uh, issue here is does food become a way of solving some other problem? Does food become a way of communicating something else which has nothing to do with either the food or the body? Uh, so as long as we don't take that into account, near uh, changing the menu is not really going to make too much of a difference because I'm thinking if it's not available at office, I'll probably order Siggy on my way back home. So it is not really going to um, uh, make too much of a difference if it's a cosmetic change. I think that's what so, we are talking about. Uh, you know, I'll also, you know, because a lot of times when we talk about healthy food versus unhealthy food, you know, the assumption is that a lot of the Indian food tends to be healthy versus a lot of the, uh, you know, so-called imported food, whether you're looking at chips, burgers, pizzas, ice cream, eggs, donuts, those are all the unhealthy foods. Would you like to talk about that? I mean, is that my perception or is that the way it actually is? How would you see it? I know, I mean, I think this is becoming a nutrition, uh, you know, discussion more than just looking at a psychology discussion, but I think that's also an important issue to look at. If I can take that. Yeah, sure, no, any. <laughs> uh, because, again, ma'am, if you look at um, how healthy food is depicted in a child's textbook, and going back to parenting here, so there'll be one thali with Indian food in it. 
and there's nothing wrong in it because it, our uh, technique traditional indian food with dal and sabzi and uh, you know if you eat non veg then a, a, you know bowl of some uh, some meat and then there's curd and there's you know so everything is taken care of in one thali so you have your carbs you have your roti which is your meat and you know so indian food is healthy if you eat the right things in the right proportion and moderate levels then you show unhealthy food as burgers and pizza and stuff but how often do you actually have that unhealthy food and so if you're going to sell indian food which is really delicious and um you know really good for you as healthy to your children you're marketing it wrong okay and uh, obviously they're going to uh, they're going to rebel and want to eat it <laughs> You got to change. That's change a good one. <laughs> That's what I think. Yeah, Ashlesha. Give them Indian food less often difficult. and make it exotic. <laughs> <laughs> Not difficult, actually. Yeah, make it unhealthy or call it unhealthy, and get what they want to eat because children want to be belly. Um, um, I think that that you know it's really interesting because I think what what happens initially in our early years. is children will learn what we do and a lot of you know what happens in how we are eating how we are reaching for stuff you know <clears throat> I, i guess even around alcohol behaviors around drinking are modeled and uh, so children kind of also learn to pick up and especially when when parents say like you said no no chicken for you today today is dal roti so almost like mm-hmm. dal roti is the stuff you get if Function. you've been a bad person Function. but you get something special if you've been good So definitely, mm-hmm. how the adults behave around food makes a big difference to how children behave around food as well. Uh, but uh, I also think, and you know, this, what is coming up nowadays in the nutrition, and I'm not a nutritionist, but what I know is emerging is that uh, you know this focus on what a child's body needs, what an adult's body needs, what we uh, uh, what we need depending on where we are grown up. So you know, if you're in a warmer climate, the kind of food that is better for you. If you're in a colder climate, what's better for you, and what you're more likely to retain, uh, you know. So I think there is a whole nutrition aspect to it that definitely <laughs> contributes to, uh, and your body type that contributes to your body image and the weight. But from our point of view, from a mental health point of view, I think it comes back to if you think that you know that alu paratha is going to make you gain weight and you're going to binge on it, whether it's Indian or it's you know it doesn't matter because you're using it as a way of stress eating. you know and you're going to so that is that is really what is, uh, focus would be if you whether it's indian or not mm-hmm. jyotsha a question directly uh, addressed to you uh, how can one break the cycle of emotional eating ha huh. very good question actually um i think uh, we need to start focusing on um right from the top of identifying and becoming aware of our emotions i think we need to start talking about how do we start expressing our emotions understanding uh what kind of situations make us feel in what way understanding our own triggers and then we could move towards regulating our emotions and finding other ways of uh dealing with our stress rather than constantly coming back to uh you know expressing our uh, stress through uh food so i think that's the whole uh, i'm hoping that's what we are going to be talking about and when we uh, talk about mental health and disordered eating that uh, disordered eating is not about eating it becomes about emotions so can we talk about understanding emotions can we talk about not being ashamed of our emotions can we talk about accepting and acknowledging our emotions can we talk about becoming aware of how do we feel when we feel angry uh how does our body feel how does what kind of thoughts come up what kind of memories come up when we go through these expressions and these emotions so uh getting a little uh uh within our own bodies and our minds will probably help us get more uh focused on how are we actually expressing our emotions currently and then is there a better way that we would choose to consciously do uh so that it does not necessarily have to go towards the disordered eating at all it can be dissipated through other means as well so when we are talking about uh, not cosmetic changes this is the kind of change that we are hoping to uh, actually achieve uh, i know the other two will have a lot more to add to this yeah ashlesha you want to add to that no i think you've covered it very succinctly just another thing that we can do so 
definitely looking at our emotions, which is something that we are not very open about. I think we have a, two or three emotions that people talk about openly, you know, anger or sadness or joy. But there is a range of stuff that we feel that we hardly are aware of or willing to acknowledge or talk about. And on the other end, while we are eating, I think the, if you want to look at how to break that, one of the things is to slow down our eating, which, which we hardly ever do. You know, we are eating uh, while we are doing something, we are eating uh, quickly because we need to get to something, or we, especially if you're using food as a way of uh, uh, satisfying or managing stress, slowing down definitely uh, can help you, even before you identify what that emotional distress is. What is it that's making me binge? Uh, it may be much harder to get there, but at least slowing down, like I'm binging, I need to slow down. You may get through that packet of chips, but it will take you longer, and that you'll, you'll feel probably satisfied or, you know, de-stress a lot sooner before you get through that whole package. Mm -hmm. That slowing down is something that can be done, you know, straight away if possible. Mm -hmm. I think what you're referring to is eating more mindfully. So you are paying attention mindfully. to the taste of it. Um, and uh, so you get to enjoy even if it's chips or unhealthy food that you're eating rather than just kind of rush through it. Um, so, which also actually yeah. then brings me to this thing that, you know, very often you know, when uh, I think uh, one of you had mentioned it, this thing of feeding children in front of the television. So, you know, they're not really focusing on the food, but, you know, it's a kind of a distraction in order to get the food down. That's the only thing. So, those kinds of things also, I feel, you know, when you're yeah. talking about mindful eating, I think those would be important issues. Uh, I I'll just need to attend to my uh, doorbell. Just give me a minute. But I think before that, before I go to attend my doorbell, can I throw another question to you, which is related with the relationship between trauma and body image? Yeah, trauma and body image. Shreesha, do you want to take that question? Yeah, I can start off and then you can cover me. Um, so, I mean, I guess uh, trauma, what we know biologically, trauma, especially chronic trauma, chronic stress leads to more craving of uh, sugar, more, and it also leads to more uh, collection of fat. You know, this is something that's kind of coming up in research. And while that is happening biologically, what is also happening, especially if there's been trauma around, uh, you know, uh, say physical abuse or sexual abuse or violence, there is a, a sense that develops of dislike of one's body. And it may not even be about how one looks, just about the body itself is, is something that was subject to violence, was subject to abuse, and how that can lead to dislike of one's body. Or, uh, and that can then, you know, definitely contribute to all the stress that we're talking about. Um, I don't know if anyone of us pick up from there. That's brilliant. Sorry, go on, Rory. No, 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 go on. I just wanted to comment on what you said. You know, the fact that you hate yourself if you go through trauma. And yeah. then, you know, you don't want to do something that supports yeah. your health. So, so here again, uh, uh, to uh, continue from what Ashlesha started off with, um, trauma has so many different uh, psychological, uh, physical uh, impact and interpersonal impact that I think Body image is one of the things that get affected uh, when we go through trauma. So it's, uh, you literally, um, it, it kind of uh, changes the way one relates to oneself and the world around. So that also uh, is seen with body image. So the uh, body becomes a, a medium of, uh, again, expressing that anger or the emotions that one feels, uh, that one perhaps has felt during that trauma. Uh, so it, it becomes a, a, a symbol of something. I say, uh, just as you were talking, I was thinking in trauma, what also tends to happen, there's a, like a dissociation, right? There's a coping mechanism. So often people who've gone through trauma tend to dissociate, and at that time that serves a purpose. And so the, the dissociation is there in other aspects, when they're eating perhaps, you know, so it's, it's not, they're not able to then mindfully eat or, you know, think about what's going on. So there's a, uh, anything that's related to eating and body or how they look has a detached, dissociated aspect to it, you know, so. Yeah. And also the fragmentation. So one of the other things that we see with uh, people who have difficulty with body image is uh, specific focus on one's thighs or one's hands or one's abdomen. So there's a 
bit of a fragmentation or dissociation that happens uh, even with those difficulties that perhaps is related to this as well. So one does not look at oneself as a whole, mind, body, spirit. It becomes uh, fragmented or detached in some ways and that perhaps also gets expressed through this. What I wanted to add to that is trauma, um, especially if there's child sexual abuse involved here. Uh, one of the things I think what the person goes through, the child goes through, is that did it have something to do with me, you know, or the way I look, you know, maybe I should, you know, maybe I look good, maybe that's what attracted that person, and maybe I should stop doing that, because we associate dressing, we associate the way a girl presents herself uh, to literally asking for trouble, asking for being abused. And uh, that's a very that's a terrible thing to happen. But um, I have seen a lot. I've worked with children who have been abused. And one of the things they ask also is that, Auntie, um, maybe if I dress like a boy, uh, uh, maybe if I wear glasses, maybe if I'm fat, uh, uh, do you think this, will, this would not have happened to me? Which is, again, associating your body image uh, you know, with something negative that happens with you. Maybe you know you being naturally good looking, or you know they they think that's the reason, but that's not true. That's again you know such such a terrible thing to be uh, thinking about, or how you you know frame your thoughts about around your body, around your food, around your looks, and uh, it we need to talk about. It. We need to tell parents. We need to tell children that's got nothing to do with it. A perpetrator has is not doing what they're doing because of you. They're doing that because of who they are. You know, so body imaging and trauma is a very, uh, very deep topic that can lead us to talk about a lot of sensitive things around it. I don't think we have enough time. Yeah, Shmisha, you want to add something uh, to that? What I've also, yeah, just in terms of what I've also seen in people with trauma, and this might be true of others also, is that, you know, their sleep is disturbed. There's a lot of uh, nightmares, perhaps, that might wake them up. So there is kind of what I'm seeing is emergence of like this night eating disorder, you know. There is mm -hmm. like this binging that happens in the night. And perhaps because there is no one else watching, perhaps that is when they were completely sort of shaken up by the nightmare. So that is another thing that, that seems to happen in the context of trauma, uh, where there is this, of course, I mean, binging generally is hidden a lot, but especially in the night, this hiding and binging in the night to cope with uh, trauma and perhaps anything else that might come up. Uh, on another note, the uh, there's another question. Food. Sorry? Rohini? The concept of comfort food, man. We don't have comfort anything else. We have comfort food. Yeah, comfort. I think uh, and a lot of us have our comfort foods. I think, uh, you know, that you like to eat when, you know, you're tired, when you're... Uh, worn down when you feel generally out of sorts so we and teach them that that's the way to cope right food is a way to cope why not comfort conversation why not comfort person why not comfort writing or why comfort food so again it starts from there no? i mean i think we should teach other ways so another workplace uh, workplace related issue is there any relationship between workaholism and disordered eating Yes. Yes. Especially yes, yes, with yes. gastrointestinal issues, ulcers building, okay. bad timings, terrible mm -hmm. eating, IBS. Um, there are so many related workaholic related work related issues. So of workaholism leading to uh, you know the uh, inability to eat on time. That's the kind of thing that I hear you say. But extending from that, Yotsna. So I, I would say it's. It, yeah, sure. Ashley, no, Ashley. Ashley. no, no, go ahead. Ashley. So I say I would say it depends a lot on the individual. Like it depends on how they're approaching their work, right? So if it's approached with a kind of say planned, meticulous, maybe to the exclusion of all other activities in their life, that's how we would describe workaholism. Not necessarily planned, but the the kind of single-minded focus on work and. A, a, everything else is excluded so some people who are workaholics might approach food like that and plan their meals also and make sure that everything is kind of covered in their workspace but what rohini is talking about 
is if their uh, focus is so much on work that they don't pay attention to their uh, eating time they are more likely to just binge on something that is quickly available and develop an unhealthy pattern of eating um, so that that is more likely to happen what i've also seen is that sometimes uh, especially people who are kind of overtaken by work might preempt and eat when they're not really hungry just so that they can carry on eat working you know so their the relationship with food is i'll quickly eat now so that i can work for four more hours afterwards and so not when i'm hungry or not you know when i should be eating so there's a, dis- a different kind of disordered eating pattern that develops which is focused more around work and it's not to do you know so it can be unhealthy around food uh, and if we uh, i mean like josna was saying you know if there is a perfectionistic kind of obsessionality that contributes to their workaholism that could spill over into how they might approach food also you know so if there's an underlying trait that is contributing to workaholism that could contribute to their eating disorder as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jyotsna, you want to add to that? Yeah. No, I think uh, the only other bit that I want to reiterate is how uh, it also is an issue of control and if uh, mm-hmm. that is likely to come up with this as well. So uh, going back to what we are uh, talking about of how uh, my first thought when you uh, read that question out loud was any ism is related to disordered eating. So any of the alcoholism, workaholism, all of those would be related to uh, disordered eating because it's after all um, an emotional dysregulation issue so it is perhaps no. going to show up differently with different personalities but it's certainly going to be there so you know we also hear a lot about these fatty diets these days okay whether it's atkins diet keto diet uh, you know uh, you know how would all of that play out you know when you're looking at uh, you know both in terms of disordered eating and also body image i think recently there was a case of some uh, that actress i don't remember her name who died of kidney failure and that was attributed to her being on a keto diet you know where do these uh, you know and i think over the last few years we've been hearing a lot about these types of diets you know whether it's i think atkins was another one then right now i think keto is still uh, you know something that we talk about so where do these fatty diets you know fit in yeah so whoever wants to address it first uh, jyotsna maybe i address it to you first i'm thinking it perhaps comes from the same place of um wanting to um compare ourselves with what we see on uh, on screen what we hear from other people there is a certain ideal that we have in our mind and uh, there is a disconnect between what our body can or cannot take and this becomes the only way to actually uh, achieve that ideal so there is a uh, it becomes very difficult to understand what is it that we need at this point in time i'm hungry i want to eat this not happen uh my body needs uh, according to keto i'm supposed to eat only at this time with that particular uh, kind of food and a lot of uh, keto diets by the way don't yield themselves automatically to indian food so uh, there's a lot of deficiency you can't hear me clearly okay. no we can so it's okay of, yeah so there's a lot of deficiency uh, there also okay So, uh, so we are becoming really difficult. Uh, I think uh, maybe you need to check your uh, connection, Ashleesha. Yeah, I'm just going to connect back again and come back. No, sure, sure. Yeah, Ashleesha, so, uh, uh, just I, please go on. So I think it's that disconnect also of um, what we what we need, what our body needs. Why are we doing this diet, and uh, what the diet actually prescribes? So I think there's a mishmash of a whole lot of things there. and each new diet that comes in comes in with this promising elixir of uh, you know it will solve all our problems if only i can lose this much weight then all my life's problems will be solved uh um, so and that's getting weight gaining weight losing weight building muscle whole lot of things looking a certain way um or um um uh, relationship related concerns all of those somehow seem to be resolved magically through uh, diets and that's i think uh, where the problem would be rohini you want to add on to that if uh, uh as an example if 
how many people in who who are attending this webinar know about Ruchita Deveka, and uh, you know how many of them know about uh, a psychiatrist or a therapist or a you know famous mental health practitioner. There'll be ten percent here and ninety percent there because our obsession with weight and diets and somebody who tells us that this is the way that is, you know you can get healthy is so much more than someone who can help you. Uh, common sense. I mean, the thing is, like you know, when she told you that you know no, you need to if you put a little bit of meat on your idli, you know, why the yeah. idli gets uh, is so much more digestible. Okay, the fact that you know how the fat helps. Yes. But that's not my point. Now. My point is that we know so much more about a nutritionist than a dietitian because we're obsessed about our looks and how we feel and, you know, um, what would be the ideal way for us to gain a certain weight. Our conversations, our coffee time conversations, our mealtime conversations revolve around diet plans or fads or latest trends. We invest in different kinds of weighing scales. You know, this is what happens. I mean, I have three weighing scales in my house. God knows for what, because somebody in my family thinks it's important to keep checking the body. <laughs> um, this, and I find it really annoying. I don't want to name the person, so. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is that we are getting obsessed about not about whether you're eating healthy. I mean, yes, she does. Her programs are great, and you know, I haven't been a program. But I don't want to offend anyone who likes her and respects what she says. But I, what I'm trying to make say here is that we know so much more about that because we are obsessed with our body image and about food and you know what we should be eating um, than how we feel about other things. And, uh, relationship. You want to comment on that? <laughs> I hope your sound is better now. I can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. You want to mute and unmute, Ashlesha? So anyway, while we're waiting for Ashlesha's sound to get better, let's ask another question. This is again from the audience. I'm reading it out verbatim. As mentioned earlier, eating disorder may happen either when one is eating more or eating less. My question is, if one finds him or her out of shape and wants to get back to a good shape, even when it means by dieting or exercising more, will it still be called a disorder? Because in my opinion, if I feel good, then I feel good. If I look good, then I feel good. It's not a disorder if it's done in moderation. It's when anything becomes compulsive and um, over the top that it can be called a disorder, right? I mean, which is what is the case for everything. If you're upset about something, something bad happened to you, and you cry and you feel sad, you're not depressed, right? So there is there is a difference between something becoming a disorder, or becoming an ism, like Jyotsla was saying, and uh, what is normally accepted, if it helps you feel good and you're healthy doing that, go ahead. But the moment you should know where you're crossing the line, which is when it becomes a disorder. So actually, the, I, yeah, sorry, go on, Jyotsna. No, 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 please continue. I'll, I'll come back to it. No, no, please go on. Because uh, for me, the important point that bro was brought up was not just the dieting, but also the exercise bit, which I think we haven't touched on as yet, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, for of us. So yeah. I think, you know, if you could pick up on that exercise bit, uh, Jyotsna. Sure. I'll talk about that. Uh, but to complete uh, 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 that, uh, the answer to that question, of it's not about just feeling good because I, I diet. It's about I don't feel good at all unless I do this. So nothing else gives me the uh, happiness and satisfaction and, and feel good factor unless I go on this diet or unless I look a certain way. So I ignore every other aspect of my own self. And just focus on my on the shape of my body or the weight that uh, you know that my weighing scale shows. Then that becomes a disorder. But the other important point that uh, that was also uh, is being spoken about is exercising. Also, if um, if there is a disconnect between uh, I'm enjoying the way I feel and therefore I exercise, or if I don't exercise, I feel really shitty. Then that's the problem. Uh, 
So I think we are talking about that unless I do this in a particular way to this extent, I don't really feel good at all, or I feel ashamed or terrible and those kind of things. That's when it becomes a problem. It's not so much about uh, not going on a diet. It's not about uh, not eating healthy. It is not about not exercising or exercising. It's about when everything else takes a back seat and this becomes the sole way that we uh, judge ourselves or our lives. And I feel that's when it becomes a disorder. It, um, it makes life in all other ways very, very difficult. Ashlisha, you want to come in? Can we hear? I hope yes. you can, can hear, you hear me now. now. Yes, we yes. can hear you now. Okay. Sorry, I kind of I got the snippets of what everyone was talking about the last couple of things. But I think what from what Jyotsna was saying, it's really really important. Where we, uh, if it is, uh, you know, if if our relationship with food and our body image is based on uh, dysfunction, we are approaching it from a way of dysfunction, or it's making us unhappy then that is really something that we have to be careful about. Also, in a way, I feel like, and I, you know, just coming, uh, going back to what Rohini was saying earlier, where every, we are all, everyone is aware of nutritionists. Um, in a way, I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing that we're all talking healthy. Uh, and we just need to infiltrate <laughs> mental health there also. You know? <laughs> Let everyone talk about healthy, but then we say, uh, when you're approaching healthy, are you also approaching it, you know, from an emotional, uh, uh, emotionally healthy way? You know, so uh, eat all the right nutrition, food, eat all the whatever fad you're following. As long as you're not doing it out of stress, then that's fine. You know, so if you're doing it because you want to get fit, that's actually good. If you're doing it because you want to, you know, uh, go from diabetic to pre-diabetic, that's good. If you want to, you know, achieve a certain goal of running, something, that's good. As long as it's not coming because you're stressed or because you're managing your emotions and it's coming at a cost of managing your emotions. So that is something that that would be important for us to keep in mind. It causes somebody else in your family stress. <laughs> would that also be a problem? Well, it, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> on, a, on a lighter note, if uh, there was there was one uh, I, I, there was one meme, I think that uh, ours is the only culture where uh, um, you know if the mother is fasting then the whole family gets to eat only a certain kind of food and you know it doesn't sound funny right now i have a very bad comment timing but that thing i think that is true i mean uh, we are the only culture where you know we the rest of the family has to go on the same diet because that's the person who is cooking in our house and um it's all it's all connected with that Food so those questions that have come again from the audience uh, start off by complimenting ourselves great insights shared by the panelists and able to relate quest examples shared uh, so it starts with asking are there any tips for us to consciously avoid or to come away from binge eating i think one of the things that you you know you have mentioned this thing about mindful eating but apart from that would there be other things that you would like to uh, you know inform this person and she's also got a tail question to it. So I'll just start off and Josna and Rohini, you could add to that. Um, these are tips that you know people who've uh, tried to overcome binge eating have told me that that works for them. One is definitely, you know, uh, as much as you're talking about food being available, is to reduce the access uh, when you have the impulsivity. If you have reduced access to something that you're more likely to binge on, uh, then you're uh, kind of not going to be easily, uh, you know, reaching out for something that you're likely to binge on. And so from the time you feel stressed, it basically the idea is to reduce the, to increase the, the time between the time you feel stressed till you reach the food. You know, so if you have to go and buy something, then you're going to be aware that it's it going to take that much longer. And you may use that time to de-stress yourself rather than to binge eat. So to in increase the time between the getting the easy access to food is one of the things that could help. So between the urge and getting uh, and satisfying the urge. Yeah, absolutely. And so how could you lengthen that gap so that you manage the whatever the stress is and you know reduce that find other ways of coping with the stress. The other thing is um, also over time, like when we start realizing what our relationship with food is and if there is stress that's contributing different people will start noticing that what are their triggers, what are their dysfunctional ways of coping. 
you know, which is my binge food, which is thing that doesn't really bother me. Where am I more impulsive? So understanding your own kind of uh, triggers and dysfunctional mechanisms is quite a useful way to also figure it out. And not to be too hard on yourself if occasionally it dips, you know, when, like right now, COVID time, I think all of us are kind of just maybe binging and doing what we can to cope. So recognizing that, okay, during stressful times, I might dip and then other times I'll get back to a, a more functional way of coping. So recognizing is something that's also useful, figuring out our triggers and our own uh, sort of, you know, uh, buttons that uh, that's useful to know. Jyotra, you want to add? Yeah, I think Rohini had a, a... Rohini, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, I usually uh, ask my clients to get a support system in place. There's a, there's a partner you know, a friend, a family member, spouse, colleague, someone who, um, if you have the urge to binge eat or, you know, do something that's unhealthy, um, keep them, you know, in the loop so that there is someone who's exercising an external control over you. And that I've seen kind of helps uh, stopping them from that indulgence or that, you know, that excessive need that they have to binge eat. And, you know, someone who tells you your conscience stopping you, saying they don't do it. It, uh, and it seems to help as well. So that's one thing I want to add. Yeah. I, I was also thinking maybe, um, sorry, Roni, are you? No, no, no. That's yeah, what I was just noting. Okay. So uh, the other thing that uh, we usually do in, in sessions is to have some sort of a, an emotional toolkit for self to, uh, like what Ashesha was saying, identifying what are my triggers and looking at what are the times that I actually reach out for food and what kind of food, more like a, uh, a scientific experiment for self rather than a point to kind of put myself down. Uh, to be curious a little bit about, you know, when is it that I eat more? What kind of food I, do I generally like? Uh, is there a way to um, uh, find other ways of dealing with those triggers rather than just uh, immediately reaching out for food? So maybe having some kind of a customized uh, uh, emotional toolkit like uh, some bit of physical activity, some bit of talking to friends, some bit of uh, other things that you could perhaps uh, do during that time when you are stressed out. So the uh, the journey between feeling the urge to eat to actually finding the food that Ashesha was talking about, if those are punctuated by other ways of dealing with stress, perhaps you're likely to, you know, uh, deal with the stress much before you actually hit the packet of food. Uh, there's another question sure. which I, I think we have to address. Uh, you know, what is healthy eating? Is it not eating uh, fried food? Is that what it is? So I think we need to deconstruct what healthy eating is. Gosh, I wish there was a nutritionist here or yeah. something. So, <laughs> um, I actually, uh, so I had a, a response to the previous one which probably follows on to this and I hope others who are more of an expert here could talk about it. But I feel like definitely moderation is something that people talk about, right? So whatever we are doing in moderation and balance uh, is something that um, can constitute to working towards a more healthy system. Also, uh, what we are used to, probably what we are uh, bombarded with is this variety that, you know, uh, we need to eat different kinds to, to satisfy our uh, excitement. But what is biologically actually what is healthy is if you're uh, subjecting to your body to uh, a, a kind of a routine of time, routine of proportion and routine of uh, the kind of food you're eating. So there's not so much of variation every day, something, you know, different. And that actually your body has to adjust a lot more to, you know, every different thing, exotic thing you're exposing it to. So maybe having a more, not boring, but a more routine, interesting, but routine uh, eating habit and every now and then you have something exciting perhaps that is healthy eating I wouldn't uh, profess that I follow it but <laughs> I'm throwing it in there. I think we can be he eating healthy all the time I think there are times yeah, when exactly. we don't want to eat healthy yeah Rohini you want to add on what according to you is healthy eating um, I mean eating till I mean in the, in the sense not overdoing anything, like Ashresha was saying, that moderation. I don't think having fried food is such a bad thing to do, as long as that's not the only thing you're having. I mean, if you're eating fried food all the time, or that's all you like and you're avoiding everything else, then no, that's not okay. 
So that's why this um, textured food, different texture. Make sure that there is something soft, there is something liquid, there's something oily, there's something crispy, there's something, uh, you know? So if you can have all those textures on your plate, then that's probably healthy eating. Textures, you've said color also, I think. No, you can add color, color to that. Textures yeah. and color. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I, I mean, I think uh, pop literature does talk about, you know, how you need to eat uh, colored food, you know, and how colored food, again, is usually better for us than, uh, you know, <laughs> foods where, you know, which are browned to the point that there's no color left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, anything in moderation. Anything exciting. Also, uh, I think one of the things is uh, to watch for, uh, we have a lot of cued behaviors that get connected to food, you know, like when you're watching something, when you're reading something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So activities that cue us into eating even when we're not hungry. Um, and that is something probably to watch out for. Where we're more likely to reach for food because it's cued to other behaviors. And maybe breaking those cycles might be helpful. Replacing it with eating something that is healthier at that time. Why yeah, can't you uh, have fruits when you watch a movie? Why do you need popcorn and chips and cola? You know, we are so much with fun, I guess. different <laughs> kinds of food. <laughs> this is a question again that's I think it's important for us to look at. What message do you have for families uh, with respect to how they manage conversations related with weight and healthy eating, especially with teenagers? Can I take that? Or yeah, sure. So we can um, take it again in terms. <laughs> yes, Rohini, we we'll start with you. Yeah. Uh, I think it starts with acceptance from the parents and, you know, without condition. Your child is, they are the way they are. You need to look at them as a person rather than someone you want to live vicariously because you have weight related issues and you know you feel that your first, your child is going to follow the same example or you feel that they won't find a groom or a bride or you know i i haven't heard too many parents talking to their children about don't have this because this you're going to fall sick they talk about the children don't have this because you're going to look bad you know which i think is a very negative association to your child's body image uh, and their association with food as well i mean we don't associate food with health and you know make yourself feel better and feel healthy or stronger uh, why that's important we look at it very differently and uh, wrongly if you ask me i think that is where it comes from it comes from home everything charity begins at home is it's a very very true thing everything starts at home how you look at it how you feel about yourself how you um what so are the words you associate with acceptance yourself? Uh, yes. Yosha, you want to add to that? I think the uh, openness in um, in just talking about it to understand what the teenager also feels about it, because uh, it's not that the uh, the child uh, himself or herself does not um, does not have something to say in return. So it's not so much about the parents doing it for the child. I think it's about uh, you know uh, creating an alliance with them so they can sit down and talk about what else is happening. So uh, then, of course, is uh, is modeling for the child. Do the parents themselves follow what they are uh, talking about? Uh, uh, can they comfortably talk about other difficult areas? It's not just about weight. It's usually connected to multiple other things. So if it is showing up in terms of weight, it usually means that there are a few other things also which are uh, which are hidden, and that needs to be spoken about as well. So openness and communication and addressing it for what it is is perhaps really important and the parents need to be also comfortable handling that difficult uh, conversation um Ashlesha, you want to add I, I agree with you. sorry josna you were saying something no no i said i'll come back to it if i can think of anything more. please take it up no, I, I completely, uh, uh, you know, agree with uh, what Rohini and Jyotsna are saying. I think accepting and modeling, and modeling is a big one because I think no matter how many lectures we give our children, they're less likely to listen, but they're more likely to do what you are doing. And they're more likely to follow it instinctively, uh, you know, what they've seen you do. Uh, the other thing is also, I think the conversation needs to move from weight completely. It needs to focus on fitness and, you know, health and, 
you know, oh yeah, I've, I've got a knee injury, so I need to do physio rather than I'm overweight, so I need to manage my, uh, you know, weight. So I think the, the conversation is to come to weight, not start with weight. You know, I think if weight should be an incidental thing, it should not be like the focus, like whether we are overweight or how we look, but how healthy do we feel? Do we feel fit enough to, you know, go to the walk to the shops and buy something or are we going to complain and whinge about it? Um, so I think fitness and uh, feeling fit and feeling uh, healthy is more important because there are there are quite a few, I know, you know, especially adolescents for girls more, but I think for boys also, where body's changing, there is a probably weight gain, you know, during puberty. And so gaining weight is something that is so difficult for them. It's more important to sort of talk about, you know, how fit can you be? And there are, say, what young girls who look obese for them, but actually are very fit. And so that's not appreciated or uh, understood. So how they look becomes a focus. So I think focusing on fitness is more important. And if it starts from there, then it might be easier to incorporate other conversations as well. I think uh, I think we've run out of time and we can continue talking about this and there are plenty of questions which I don't think we will answer. I think I hope we've tried to answer some of the questions. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you actually, including the audience for, you know, really coming in and, you know, helping this conversation be so interactive, I'd say. I mean, and I don't think I've uh, gone through most of the questions that I had uh, listed actually that I would have liked to go through as well. Uh, I just like to tell the audience that there are two handouts uh, which uh, the uh, panelists have actually put together. One handout is specifically about issues of uh, eating disorders and body image. There are some resources which have been uh, mentioned there. Apart from that, the contact details of the panelists are also there in case anybody wants to get in touch with them. Uh, the other handout is just a list of, uh, you know, telephone resources that uh, people can reach out to. These are essentially counseling services. Uh, Nisha, over to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I must say such a wonderful, uh, you know, discussion and the kind of insights we've had into this, you know, at the very basis of our existence, which is uh, many a time food and revolves around what we consume. So thank you so much. Uh, we've had a whole lot of learnings and I'm sure I speak on behalf of all the participants. Uh, we've had, um, I think a little short of uh, 200 people who had uh, signed in for this session. So um, uh, Ashlesha ji, Rohini ji, Jyotsna ji, uh, heartfelt thanks to you for having spared precious time to uh, share your uh, knowledge and nuggets of uh, wisdom with all of us and uh, Dr. Sriram, thank you for uh, having orchestrated the entire discussion so wonderfully. Um, as we conclude, uh, I would urge everyone to participate in the tweet quiz tomorrow. Do spare 15 minutes of your, of your time mm -hmm. at 11 a.m. tomorrow. And uh, if you are <laughs> able to answer all the questions, uh really fast you stand to win uh, a prize so we urge you to do this you simply need to tune into twitter on our handle which is at the rate nhrdn and answer the questions it's as simple as that um quick reminder on a session that we have lined up for you tomorrow uh, which is the conclusion uh, of sorts of this uh, you know set of initiatives we would like to remind you that uh, we intend to keep this entire movement on. Uh, it's not a one-time affair. This is just the beginning. But yes, Mind Matters Week uh, this time around would be concluding tomorrow. We urge you to join us to uh, see what all we have been able to reflect on over the past week. Um, we would not have been able to present this entire set of offerings to you if not for our partners. So uh, we wish to thank them explicitly, uh, Knowledge Partner, White Swan Foundation, Academic Partner, TIS, uh, represented ably by uh, Dr. Sujata Sriram, LinkedIn Learning, who is our learning partner, and uh, Communication and Design Partner, Fulki, who have uh, very ably and beautifully brought through all the various uh, thought processes and presented it uh, so wonderfully. Thank you all. We look forward to meet you all tomorrow. And um, 
help us spread this uh, you know movement that we have set rolling and we hope to be able to impact workspaces positively thank you all we really need to keep this movement going i think we've started it we need to keep it keep the ball going absolutely thank you all thank, thank you so you. much thank you, thank you. good evening bye bye thanks nisha good evening bye. thank you bye bye